Hello everyone, thanks for joining my talk. My name is Emily Nag and I'm a PhD student with the Animal Warfare Program at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Today I'd like to talk to you about the effect of two methods of castration on the growth and intake of dairy calves. What I hope you will learn during this talk is that if you compare surgical castration with rubber and castration and look at wound healing, weight gain, grain intake and wound directed behavior, you will realize that rubber and castration induces longer lasting post-operative pain than surgical castration. So first, why do we castrate dairy bull calves? Most dairy bull calves don't actually stay on the dairy farms, but they're sold for beef production in which animals are castrated. The reasons for this procedure is reducing aggression, reducing unwanted behavior such as mounting, and also improving the quality of the meat and reducing the amount of dark cutters. So at this point, you might wonder, why is castration a relevant topic for the dairy industry? To that, we can say that first, dairy bull calves are produced by the dairy industry. So to some extent, we're accountable for the quality of life of these animals. And also, recent recommendations state that calves should be castrated as young as possible. So eventually that might result in castration having to be done on dairy farms. The problem with castration is pain. There are already quite a few studies on this topic and when you look at intraoperative pain, comparing surgical castration with rubber and castration, they show that surgical castration induces higher amount of intraoperative pain than rubber and castration. But now the question that we're asking is what about long lasting postoperative pain? And that's what we looked at in this study. So we were interested in looking at surgical castration versus rubber and castration. For that, we enrolled 24 Holstein bull calves and we castrated them with a veterinarian at 28 days old, either surgically or with the rubber ring. We provided the highest level of pain control at the time of the procedure. This means sedation, local anesthesia, and analgesia. And then we followed these calves for eight weeks after the procedure. The first thing that I would like to talk about is wound healing. So for surgical castration, it consists of an incision of the scrotum and complete removal of the testes. And the, the wound fully heals after four weeks. For the rubber and castration, it's a little bit different. It's in two times. So first, we apply the rubber ring, and it's going to interrupt the blood flow to the testicles and results in the tissues dying off, becoming necrotic, and eventually slough off. The slough off happened on average seven weeks after we applied the rubber ring. And then there is still a secondary residual wound that needs to heal. And for that, I saw full healing only in one calf at eight weeks after we applied the rubber ring. So you can see already that between these two methods, there is a difference in how long it's taking for the wound to heal. Another thing that we looked at was the weight of these calves. So here on the y-axis, you can see the weight in kilograms. On the bottom axis, you can see the days of, after castration. So day zero is the day of the procedure, and day 56 is eight weeks after the procedure. You can see two curves. In blue is the calves that were surgically castrated, and in red, the calves that were castrated with the rubber ring. The first thing that you can see is on the second half, rubber ring, our rubber ring calves are growing slower than calves that had the surgery. And eight weeks after castration, this results in a 13.5 kilogram difference. So rubber in calves are smaller than calves that had the surgery. So when we saw that, we were wondering, where is this difference coming from? These calves were not weaned. They had access to 12 liters of milk every day. And when we looked at milk intake, there was no difference. So then we looked at grain intake. So here is the data for their grain intake. You can see on the y-axis the amount of grain that they're eating in kilograms. And on the bottom axis is the days after castration. Day zero is the day of the procedure, and day 56 is eight weeks after. You can see the two curves in blue again is the calves that had the surgery, and in red, the calves that had the rubbery. The first thing that you can see here is that the calves that had the rubbery start eating grain later than calves that received the surgery. 
and eight weeks after the procedure, the difference in intake, intake is of 0 0.4 kilograms. So what does that mean? We told that the calves that had the rubbering were smaller than the calves that had the surgery. And all these calves still have to go through the winning transition. Winning transition is harder on calves that don't eat as much solid feed. So what might happen is that after winning, there might be an even bigger difference in weights between the calves that had the surgery and the calves that had the rubbering, with calves that had the rubbering being even smaller. Another thing that we looked at is wound-directed behavior. Wound-directed behavior is a common way to assess pain in animals. And in the case of castration, a common measure is lesion leaking. So how many times are the calves going to leak the scrotal area? So here, what we did is that we recorded the calves for three days prior to castration, and we averaged the number of times that they were leaking their lesions every day. And we brought that value down to zero, and here you can see that's their baseline. For three days after castration, we counted again the number of lesion leakings, and then weekly thereafter for 24 hours. So in red, you have again the calves that had the rubbering, and in blue, the calves that had the surgery. What you can see is that in both groups, there is an increase in the number of lesion leakings shortly after castration. But quickly, the calves that had the surgery are going to recover and go back to baseline, whereas the calves that had the rubbering remain quite high. This actually represents an increase of 25.8 times leaking the lesion. So what does that mean? If, for example, if you had a calf that before castration was leaking its lesion or the scrotal area, because it can just be itchy too, on average like five times, after castration, he's going to leak the same area 30 times every day. So that is at least a sign of discomfort and in the case of a painful procedure, we could say it's a sign of pain. You can see that the calves with the rubbering are going close to baseline here towards the end, which is actually just at the time of slough off. So the take home message from this presentation is that if you look at wound healing, weight gain, brain intake, and wound directed behavior, you can see that rubbering castrated calves seem to suffer from longer lasting postoperative pain than calves that had the surgical castration. On this note, I would like to thank all of our sponsors for supporting our research. Thank you for watching and please leave any questions or comments that you might have in the chat box. Thank you.